Welcome to our weekly Wednesday forum. Uh, today, I don't know what time is it now in India, bro. It's 11.35. Okay. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Malpur. I am a doctoral uh, student of ICRS and I'm signed to be a moderator of this uh, current session of the Wednesday forum. And thank you for uh, being with us. And uh, you know that uh, Wednesday Forum is a uh, cooperation between CRCS and ICRS, and I think it has been going for years. I quite remember that uh, when I was uh, working for uh, CRCS, uh, uh, we already had this kind of Wednesday Forum. Uh, it's a platform for our students, faculty, and our uh, and uh, scholars all around the world to, to share their, their perspective, their studies, uh, their, their current research on uh, many uh, different topics. So it is uh, it is uh, uh, it is an honor uh, an honor for me to be a uh, moderator of this uh, forum. Well, uh, today uh, we we have a special guest. Uh, we have Pro Pro Professor Nep, and we we are going to discuss about uh, the the topic of uh, uh, you know the, the the broken words between the prophetic anger and and, and human compassion. Uh, when I I read first the, the the term prophetic anger, is it quite interesting to me because. You know, uh, anger is usually attributed attribute to humanity, but we now have uh, prophetic anger and how uh, it relates to uh, our current uh, situation that was not described as a broken world. It's quite interesting. If I may add to the title of our uh, discussion today, probably we can also add a uh, broken heart. So it is not just a broken word, Prof. Matt, but also broken heart, uh, considering that we are now facing uh, many kind of uh, you know humanity tragedies, uh, such as uh, now there is war between Russia and and Ukraine, and we also facing uh, global warming and etc. So it's also uh, you know uh, lead us to what is called broken broken heart. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, as a moderator, I, I would like to remind uh, you that when uh, the, you know, the, the, the presentation is going on, I would like to ask you to, to uh, you know, to move the speakers, uh, the, the, the speakers and uh, Prof. Net, our discussion is usually divided into two, 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 two sessions. First is a presentation, it's about 45 minutes, and then the rest is a question and answer. Okay, uh, everyone, before I start, I would like to uh, read briefly the short bio of uh, Prof. Nep. His full name is Nadaraja Manikam. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yes. He no is problem. a sociologist who has worked over the last 40 years in many capacities and positions in multi faceted and interconnected project and initiative. Uh, Paknat is invited by Xavier University Bhubaneswar, Odisha, India, to set up a center for new humanities and communication studies. At present, he serves as an honorary educational consultant, setting up uh, the multiversity platform at Loyola Extension Services, Loyola College of Social Sciences, Rifandrium, Kerala, India. Uh, Profnet uh, is currently uh, based in, in India. Uh, okay, without any further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Profnet to uh, share his uh, presentation. And as I told uh, all the participants, please uh, mute your, your speakers while uh, Prof. Uh, Nadaraja Manikam is speaking. Okay, without any further ado, please, uh, this skin is yours, Prof. Profnet. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, share some of my experiences, thoughts with all of you. Am I audible? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, sometimes these lines are a little tricky. So, uh, uh, so thank you very much. <clears throat> I uh, uh, for this kind of uh, programs, I usually sing a song uh, of a particular kind. And uh, so, if you have had attended any of my sessions, <laughs> you will probably hear the same song or something similar. So, uh, uh, if you have to bear it, uh, you may, uh, uh, you know. Uh, you, you can sit through or you can uh, do whatever you want, but this is a song that I sing. This presentation is something which is very close to my heart, uh, close to my, to my experience. And I come here as uh, not only to share with you a, 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 the experience, but also a sense of uh, guilt uh, in not being able to do as much as I would like to do in this broken world. Yeah? So I also come as a person who uh, is part of a system that has given us or put us in a way to, uh, uh, to contribute consciously, unconsciously <laughs> to, uh, to create a, situ a situation which is difficult for us and for many, many people whom, uh, who, who, who live in this world. So let me uh, start by uh, 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 sharing uh, some thoughts I have. I have three sections. I hope I can cover it within 40 minutes. But I hope that some are covered during the question and answer session. So the, the first part is basically to uh, look at the state of the world. And in that, I want to just share this idea that what is the foundation we are standing on as, as you know, people who are in academics, in uh, 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 social activities, and uh, you know some of these things that we are doing as part of a, of a, <laughs> a ground. And I would like to see myself as been working with universities, uh, civil society organizations, research, and things like that, you know, that kind of thing. So if you look at the world in that context, we have, you know, over the years, we have, many, many universities. Uh, uh, the last count that I checked was about 30, 30 to 40,000 universities globally, producing, again, hundreds and thousands of programs, small, big programs for students who becomes the generation, who producing generations of people, young people to serve the industry, to serve society, who become part of our our, our our managers and our leaders, these are people who pass through some university, this institution that we have created. <clears throat> we, have, we produce so many research papers, monographs, and things like that, you know, looking at the world, uh, you know, presenting solutions. And some of us are actually solutionists. We're just producing, you know, research and solution, research and solutions. We have so many of this, and there are journals and journals, you know, uh, you know, publishing these things. We have committees, technical committees, all kinds of think tanks, also managing this process or you know supporting this process. We have conferences, meetings, webinars, and things. So many things going on simultaneously, I mean, consecutively across time, space. Uh, you know, over the years. So that's the kind of foundation we are seeing. There's so much of work going on. Uh, we are still in a big mess. And that is what I like to understand as a, a, a kind of broken world. We, we, we are doing so many things. But what is the world where we are created? We are created a really broken world. Uh, broken, uh, to add to what was shared just now, uh, broken uh, physically, broken socially, broken in terms of internally, you know, your uh, kind of bro broken hearts, uh, a cruel world we have created. And if you listen to some of the young people who have pointed the finger at us, the, the older lot, you know, Greta Thunberg is a popular name, but there are many more people around the world, young people who have pointed their fingers at us saying that you people do not know what you're talking and you have, you have given a world, world to us which is actually in a mess. And you're coming here and talking and talking and doing nothing. You're really doing nothing, but you're just talking to how to keep the world going on as the way you want it to go on. 
So they have taken us to task. And you need to just listen to them carefully. Just listen to these young people who have taken us to task. You know, we think we are great leaders, we are great managers, we are great this, we are great, great that. But just listen to these young people. And I think there is something which we need to learn from them in terms of pointing their fingers at uh, our generation that we have really messed up the world. We have <laughs> created such a massive problem for them too <laughs> because it is the world that they are going to live in. We are going to go with. And they are really worried about that. And that's led to a lot of problems in the, at least in the Western societies are reporting a lot of <clears throat> uh, this nature deficit syndrome or, you know, what is my, uh, related to this, what is my future? So if you look at that broken world, let's just look for a, for a minute. Let's just, you know, uh, immerse ourselves in the world that we are living and take some responsibility for what we are, we have created consciously, unconsciously, you know, uh, directly, indirectly, sustaining. Just look, just uh, let's look at some of those figures and then, <clears throat> Take them not as figures, take them for a minute as something, uh, a reality that we are living with. Uh, I, 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 I like to share these two things usually, when there are a lot of other things. One is thing is this, if you look at the global footprint, the world overshoot, uh, you know, earth overshoot day, which means the resources that we are using. It, there's a whole idea of global footprint, let's get into the technicalities. But if we are given so much of biological resources by Earth, we have consumed that resources for 1921. I mean, 2021. By July, uh, July end, we had consumed the thing that was budgeted for us for that year, 2021. Not this is 2022. It's not going to be very different. So by July, we have consumed whatever we are supposed to consume. And from July, we have been living off the future, which means as people, we have been living, living on our children and their grandchildren's resources. I think, you know, the, the important thing is to remember that we are in this world and we are in a stuck in a system that does this and we are respond and we have to take it upon ourselves, we are responsible for it. We are living in a world where we are consuming what is not ours. And we talk so much in the house about, you know, budgeting, about this and that and all those things. But we are on a global scale, on a, on a scale being an earthling, a, a person down to earth, we have consumed. That is the situation that we have created for ourselves in the system we are living. And so when the young people are pointing their finger at us, we better pay, pay attention to them. Uh, the other is this, uh, there is a nine planetary uh, boundaries, you know, which is put up by the Stockholm Resilience Center, nine uh, boundaries which are critical for, uh, sus uh, for, us, for sustaining Earth as it were. And we have broken four, and we are continue going, continuing in the, in the wrong direction in terms of possibly breaking other boundaries, which means that we are in, uh, climate change is the biggest one no? that is now we are experiencing the, uh, uh, the, the, re the response of what's happening to our environment, our ecology is coming back to us. Nature doesn't need any support. If we get this feeling that oh, we have to uh, you know, somehow protect nature and do something about this nature system, nature will reorganize uh, itself, no issues. If we don't take care, it is our own uh, uh, demise, this whole uh, humanity and with it other species. So the reason we need to protect the uh, uh, eco regions is because we need to protect ourselves and nature doesn't need our defense. I don't think we should start from a person that we have to protect nature because many people do that. They think they want to protect nature. Nature doesn't need any protection. <laughs> uh, so in a sense, we have in the limits, in the earth limit, ecological sense, we are really messed it up. And uh, mind you, I'm asking you to keep yourself on the foundation we are in. So many universities, so many courses, environmental programs, social programs, we are on that ground and we are doing this. Now, in addition to that, 
there are some really very very troubling figures figures that, that really troubles me also very much uh, this is some figures that i will share with you but i would like to you to think about these figures or feel these figures in the context of you know your own day-to-day uh, uh, -day life right? every day we have about 150 uh, these are from different uh, organizations working on this area so i'm not naming them uh, if you want we can look at that later every day about 150 species go extinct which is about every hour the time we finish this conversation between us we would have lost about three to four or three to six species they would have disappeared from earth you know, I'm talking about small to the really big ones. Eh? So we are losing space. So our uh, uh, extinction rates are very high. And that is, I mean, there is a natural extinction rate, but we, this is human induced. Every hour, not only we are killing animals by our lifestyles and our, our system, every hour about 500 plus young people below the age of 15 are dying or they are either now as we speak some are suffering in pain and uh, and dying or dead so you know uh, that is the kind of world we are living in where we are looking uh, we are we are going about doing our work while the, all these things around us is happening you know so this death is going on uh, and <laughs> migrants there are about eight 80 million forcibly displaced migrants, and we call them migrants, they are refugees. And I think part of this belongs to the group that are facing genocide uh, possibilities. So there are people who are going through massive uh, uh, challenges as they are displaced from their home and they have no idea where they are going to go and whether they will live whether they will get the basic things we are talking about, food, this, that, and the other, they are not sure. So we have about 80 million forcibly displaced. Uh, now, if you look at forced labor, there is a modern, global modern slavery. We think the slavery has gone away, uh, you know, in the medieval, I mean, uh, some time during the uh, colonial, but there are modern slaveries. And there are about 41 million people stuck in this modern slavery system that is in, 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 in operation in different parts of the world. And this slavery deals not only with labor, but also with sexual slavery. You know? So uh, uh, trafficking in women and a number of things are taking place. Imagine now that somebody close to you is stuck in, a, is, is have been snatched away from the family and is somewhere stuck in this uh, in this trafficking of uh, human uh, uh, human labor or for uh, a woman for sexuality just imagine that just just imagine it's, it's not a it's 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 a, it's a very painful thing to imagine such a kind of situation that's a kind of society we are living in that's not one or two figures this about it runs into million, billions huh? and um, uh, for, so is forced labor <laughs> and i i will wind up with this this one figure there are about 3.5 million female labor offering care, okay, in 2021. Out of these 3.5 million, they, uh, the world gets 12.5 billion hours of free labor, free care labor, taking care of us. And that, when they costed it, it is about $10.8 trillion a year, which means the world is not paying nor giving benefits in any way to a group of women, girl child, globally. Uh, and you, if you look at the figures of what's happening to women, what's your women, girl child, I just now told you about forced labor. A large number of them are stuck there, forced to offer care in many, many, many terms, you know, this care idea of care is also, when you're talking about compassion, you please keep in mind that this is, you know, sometimes seen as compassion, this, that, and the other, but look at the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, cruelty we, 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 uh, we uh, force on to women and girl child. And when you actually translate, translate that into 
dollars and cents, it's about 10, uh, 11 trillion dollars. Now imagine that amount of money is offered, not necessarily in money, in terms of Excuse me, Prof. Net. I think your your speaker is mute. Uh, when did it go mute? <laughs> I, I, don't, I have no idea. Okay. Is it, One minute, uh, probably. Okay. Uh, did you hear about the women, ch uh, girl, child amount, uh, the figures? Yes. Yes. Three point nine uh, million uh, female labor. Did you heard? Did you hear that? Hello? Yeah, yes, we did. Uh, yes. Okay, fine. Then it's not for a lot. So what I'm trying to uh, say is, look at these figures of, uh, uh, of a global footprint, the world overshoot day. Imagine, look at the planetary boundary breaking habit we, we have. Look at the number of child, a young person who will die with it before we finish this program. Look, look at feel the species that will disappear before we finish this program. You just take a few minutes, a few seconds, just think about that. That is the world that we are living in. And that's the broken world that we are living in. That's a broken, cruel world we are living in. Am I, am I responsible for it? Are you responsible for it? I think we, we just think about it. Just think about why do these young people get together and tell us that you, you managers and you leaders, you have really messed up our future. You are not only messed up the world, you are talking nonsense and you're messing, messing up the future. Can you, can you imagine for a while that, you, uh, that this, is the, uh, this is the thing that we get in spite of me doing a lot of things. And it just for a minute, uh, for a second, you just think about these things and I have been unable to, uh, you know, this is something after hearing these young people, after looking at these figures, looking at, you know, my own life. This is something that I have been, you know, uh, trying to digest, trying to uh, address, trying to uh, uh, speak about, uh, do things, some things here and there. This is what is the basis of this whole discussion that we are living in a broken, cruel world. And all these big things that we have talked about, including the UN SDGs, UN SDGs started how many years ago? And look at the figures, we, don't, we have no figures to show great at once in the gross figures that we are faced with, which I just shared with you. It's all UN, UN SDGs, all looks good. You know, nationally we report, reporting this, that, and the other. All this looks good, maybe required. But look at the figures that I shared with you that those things are not, you know, going down anyway. It's been there. I started my life uh, in the social works, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so civil society organization around 27 years old. I am about going to be 70 now. These figures have not really changed. It's only become worse. And the extinction at that time was almost, you know, something which we can, uh, you know, but now it's in a, it's, it's gone, it's, it's a runaway figures, you know. So I, what I'm trying to, uh, you know, ask you to look is, we have to all take responsibility for this. We have to listen to these young people who are telling us we have messed it up. And then look at, you know, actually, when you, if you have taken this, I'm done. There's nothing more to discuss. <laughs> we have created a cruel world. We have created a world where there is absolutely no compassion. Whether we are, we are conscious or we, are, uh, we have planned this, but we have created a world where there's so much of suffering, so much sites of suffering, pain, death is going on, disaster is going on. And we are part of this system. We are responsible for it directly, indirectly, consciously, unconsciously. My case stops here because there is, I'll be talking about compassion. This is compassion. This is what you are, you are talking about. This is what our religion teaches us. This is what uh, uh, our university, uh, 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 you know, teaches us. Our our uh, uh, elders teaches us. Our ancestors teaches us. This is what we are supposed to do. 
and look at the world. It is in this kind of state. Actually, I rest my case here, and we can actually stop start discussing. But uh, since I'm, uh, I'm I've given <laughs> a, a, a way to you know go through this uh, program, uh, I will share a few other uh, 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 observations that I have, and and then we may go into the Q and A section. Uh, how much of time do I have left? You have still uh, around an hour. Another oh, another hour. Yes. Uh, for a presentation, you have fifteen minutes. Yeah. How many? You have an, uh, about fifteen. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. So that is that is uh, the first thing I want to place before you. Uh, not as a lecture, but as someone who is concerned about the world, someone who wants to reach out in a compassionate fashion, hopefully, to the world. This is the world that we have created by our own actions, uh, consciously, unconsciously, planned on planned. That doesn't really matter. We are in a system, stuck in a system. Now, how did we come here? How did we come here? I think that is something which... Uh, you know, now I'm presenting, what I gave you just now is some of the figures which are available to everyone. What I'm now presenting is something which I have thought out in my own uh, uh, attempts to address these attempts, my own guilt, my own uh, difficulty in accepting what has happened. Uh, though I've been working in the uh, civil, society, civil society sector from when I was 27, I, I still feel, you know, so many things when not done and actually it's, it's gone into in a different direction. No, no, this climate change thing is such a massive issue that we are all facing in a, and, and a, a minor increase in temperature to 1.5. You know, we have, we'll have such a massive problem, social, ecological problem facing humanity, facing uh, 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 other species, you know, and those, those, societies living by the sea, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, you're going to, we're going to have so massive problem. I live, I live in a state which has got such beautiful sites near the sea. It's all going to disappear if, if we are unable to turn this temperature thing around. Okay, now coming down to why, why, why are we here, you know, and, uh, and what is that we can, we can do? <clears throat> Just, just before that, I wanted to conclude this sharing with you this, but I want to share it now. There is a beautiful uh, Japanese practice, a culture, you know, it's called uh, Kintsugi. It's, uh, it's, it's about how to celebrate brokenness. You know, that is, if, if you have something broken, you plaster it with gold and preserve the thing that is broken. You, you, you keep it back. You know, you don't throw away what is broken. You need, you need it and you can preserve it. But you, you, build the, you put back the broken pieces in gold and keep it back. It, it, it's called Kintsugi. It's the same thing that we need. Since the world is broken, it doesn't mean that we throw it away. We cannot. Anyway, we have no choice. We, we, we have to live with it. But what is happening today is we are not plastering it with, with what I think should be not technology, but compassion. The brokenness have been put together through compassion. That is not happening. This brokenness is becoming further broken. You know, our, 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 our technic, uh, technology infatuation, uh, whatever that we want to do, this whole thing that we are doing is actually only breaking and breaking the world further and further, creating more sites of pain, suffering, disaster, death. We are not putting this brokenness of the world together and celebrating our own stupidity for breaking the world and putting it back in a way in which we... we uh, uh, bring back the uh, always. Always doesn't mean I'm talking about you know going back to the uh, but ways in which we can keep the world uh, safer, more compassionate, more humane, uh, more ecologically uh, uh, sound. So 
so so the the point that i'm trying to make is somewhere along the line we have created a system where this brokenness is further broken into many sides of pain huh? and suffering and death now what is this that is creating this more and more brokenness of the world that is what i have been examining and one of the things is that is you know in the, one of the very powerful uh ancient way of thinking and very very required way of thinking is the idea of totality idea of thinking of interconnectedness and interdependence of the world of everything that we are surrounded by everything so that is, is this whole idea of a totality which is has this structured interdependence and interconnectedness now that we have lost you know that cosmological kind of thinking that total totality thinking that you know structured mindfulness way of thinking that we have lost and we have fragmented the world you know in the, under this whole uh, modern university system that brought in at a particular time the whole idea of disciplinarity disciplines actually broke us broke nature into many compartments uh, into departments into faculties and you know this disciplinary university creating disciplines uh, sustained by disciplines creating disciplinary modes of thinking has fragmented the world tremendously we don't see the world in a, in totality we don't see the we don't see even the connection between art and science because we have become so so fragmented in our mind and in our production of knowledge you know our if you go and do a phd in sociology they will ask you how is this sociological you know they won't see, they if you if you only just add a little bit of arts and science and philosophy they will ask you a number of questions uh, this is not sociological we have to be sociological or we have to be political whatever it is you know economic so this whole ancient way of thinking which is so so critical for us to be able to conceive of a uh, of a society of nature now in a particular interconnected interdependent way we have broken this and the central institution and approach to that is this whole disciplinarity and university i think it was required at a particular time the the uh, use for university and disciplinarity is over i think we need to get out of it are we ready to get out of it i do not know you know uh, i don't think that it is so easy to do that and many people here itself would resist a notion like that but people are not talk people you know even in university they began to understand the serious problems of disciplinarity and so, so they started thinking about oh we are a interdisciplinary center you know they knew the problem of this you know breaking 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 doesn't help so we have to bring back knowledge we have bring back the different practices so they started talking about oh we are an interdisciplinary center we are an interdisciplinary faculty we have an interdisciplinary institute so so all this discussion from disciplinarity to multidisciplinarity to interdisciplinarity is a is an evidence that there was a problem in the way in which produce knowledge which was absolutely scarred by the fact that we broke nature and do uh, and did not see the interconnectedness of the world and to produce knowledge in that from that interconnectedness in that totality of what nature is to to absorb the gray in the area we don't want well, a not a you know this logical thinking a not a and forgetting about that gray in which we have to also theorize we forgot so materialism no no spirituality these two are two different things so many things came into being because of this disciplinary way of thinking this logical way of thinking this university framework that as put a, put us in a particular direction that is one problem that i think a universities are major culprits to what the world is today because they are the one who are producing i'm not or, uh, i'm not talking about the young people who are produced uh, generation after generation it is a university and a framework that is producing these generations of people who are going out and doing a work looking after themselves but what they are doing is you know every year there are about 10 trillion tons of poisons environmental toxins pumped into the environment 10 point is about 11 trillion tons 
every year. And where do these trillion tons come from? From the industries around the world. 11 trillion tons of environmental poison. And don't forget some of this poison are the poison that is in the air, which has weakened our immunity and has weakened our breathing system, which has been one of the major, one of the very important cause in many people dying because they cannot deal with a system which is already compromised. They cannot deal with a body which is where the immunity is compromised. So we have 11, ton, 11 uh, trillion tons of poison pumped into the environment, land, air, uh, uh, water. Where do you think this come from? This come from all the industries we have created around the world. Great achievement. We report annual reports. These industries are the ones they are pumping their poisons. And where, who do you think is working in these industries? The graduates we produce in the different universities across the world. We send to people different places, oh, learn this industry, that industry, you know. And these industries are creating generations of workers, feeding the uh, uh, labor force, feeding the industries, and these industries are producing this much of poison into their environment, which is hurting us. So who is responsible for this? Why, why, why shouldn't we take the universities to task for creating this kind of situation? We won't, we won't, we cannot, we, we don't even think that it's a, that's logical, this is a madman talking about it, but they, this nexus between the, uh, you know, increasing nexus between the university and the uh, industry, creating generations of workers, young people who fit into the industry system, industrial system, pumping so much of poison into the environment, creating the whole problem of uh, 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 our breathing. Pandemic uh, issue is one, but we have created so much of problem for ourselves, health-wise, and also the environment. Where do you think this uh, climate change coming from? It doesn't come from the uh, moon. It's not God created. It's we created. And who created it? Universities were responsible for it. We need to have uh, such a, a strong uh, a critical evaluation of universities and their contribution to the global problems today. We don't. We only look at some industries, some this, some that, but the industries are being working very closely with the universities. I think universities have to be taken to task across the, across the board. <clears throat> and some of the political problems of the third world in the 60s and 70s came out from universities in the West. If you look at even the problem in Indonesia, the murder, the, the, the killing of so many communists. Many of these things came, comes out from uh, economists who came out from certain universities in the West into the third world. So universities have been responsible for many, many difficulties uh, we are faced with. So this is not about any particular university. This is about a system we are living in and we have outgrown the need for university or university frameworks and outgrown the need for disciplinarity. We have to go into multidisciplinarity or now they, what they are talking about is transdisciplinarity. So you have to, we have to move these modes of production of knowledge and get out of this disciplinary mode that you have to be this and this and this, fragmenting our ideas of the world, fragmenting our self, our body, biological self and the spirit. We have so much destroyed the connection between what is us and what is our spirit. So I think that's the first major thing that I want to submit to you that there is uh, this university industry occupational infrastructure, occupational edifice, this nexus we have to change over the years. Of course, it cannot be done. And we have to rethink the university, we have to rethink the way in which we are encouraging production of knowledge. You know, knowledge has to become public and it has to reflect beyond the disciplinary disciplinarity uh, purity because that is not going to help us that is not at all is going to help us we need the unity of a, a diverse way of producing knowledge and that i think is something which i like to share with you the second is about this growth model in economy i don't want to go into maybe you all have heard of G, this gnp focus you know this this madness this seduction by the idea of growth 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 even un sdg is so much about growth, growth, growth to, to, to address our poverty, we have to grow and grow and grow. And if you look at the figures, you're not going to achieve even, even uh, some prediction is you need about 200 years before that kind of growth to take care of the global uh, poor. If you're just going to focus on the idea of growth to take care of poverty, 
because the idea of poverty comes from the fact that there are some people who are affluent for no reason and who are so we are only investigating poverty which is a UN SDGs one major aspect of UN SDGs concern is poverty how to get rid of poverty how to not leave people behind but in the same breath they don't want to just investigate affluence affluence is as as much uh, a problem as much as uh, poverty but affluence is always seen as achievement and not being not being interrogated and uh, find out you know in 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 during the pandemic 2021 there are some uh, we will not name them they are, they, they are trapped into pandemic predators they were making 1.3 billion dollars per day in 2021 during the peak of the pandemic what do you think this is this is compassion this is not a, this are, it's not about compassion this is an absolute cruelty this is absolute madness when you have 1.3 billion dollars being made per day during the peak of the pandemic. And we are talking about poverty. Why don't we talk about affluence? Because we dare not talk. It's the same thing. We don't want to, the, we are talking about peace, 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 but we don't want to talk about those people who are making money out of peace. So in the same country, we'll talk about peace in one side will be the highest seller of weapons on the other side. Where, I mean, how do you understand this? When you have somebody who's talking about peace and peace and peace, and then talking uh, selling weapons, the highest sellers of weapons. Okay, and you can go and look at the figures yourself. And the, a certain group of countries will keep coming up and up again. Now that gives me that brings me to the most important cause of this problem: the where we are, the kind of world we are we have received, the world we are living in, the world we are responsible for. We each one of us here responsible for directly, indirectly, planned, unplanned, that's another matter. We are responsible for <laughs> in order that our younger people, you know, we can answer them. You can even see them on their face, uh, to see them in the eyes. Now, how do we the most critical thing is this whole idea of a moral and spiritual crisis? That is the most critical thing that we are faced with. We are in the midst of a very deep moral and spiritual crisis. And that is the reason why we, this knowledge is not helping us. Technology is not helping us. 40,000 institutions are not helping us. Growth and growth, we have too much of growth. In fact, the growth we have is enough to help us you know, supply food to the needy. Go and look at the World Food Program. They are asking the, the rich, they're begging the, from the rich, super rich, just give us 5% of your earnings and we will take care of all the hungry people in the world. It's, it's such an immoral thing, you know, that they are asking 5% of their earning of the super rich people to take care of the people who are dying of hunger, they are starving, and this, so if you look at the world of, uh, food program, you can you will see another side of the story of this this affluence, not uh, you know this 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 pathology of affluence, as much as you talk about uh, 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 poverty. So, so I think this whole idea of peace, talking peace, uh, uh, and then uh, selling weapons, uh, uh, people making money out of the pandemic. You know, all these things, when you add up all these things, including us, huh? we, we talk so many things, but, uh, you know, there are small, small things we can do, but we don't want to get there. Uh, if you look at... That, yes. one, more minute, one more minute. Okay, I will stop here and we can talk about that later. So we have something, the, the, the point is, we are in a deep moral and spiritual crisis. And I think if we do not address this moral and spiritual crisis, we are not going to, you know, reach out to that uh, state of being compassionate uh, to take care of this broken world, to, to put it by the kintsugi, the, the compassion patched brokenness of our world. Eh? So I think that is with which I, I, with that I will stop and maybe in the discussion I could share it a bit more, but I will, I, I will, I, I will stop here. Thank you so much. I'm, I, I, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, I think we, it is clear that uh, 
we are currently uh, living in a broken world and the brokenness of the world is also part of our uh, responsibility i mean uh, it is it is uh, we are now we are that we are responsible also to the to the, the broken uh, the, the broken world and i think uh, that there is some point that i would like to highlight uh, in 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 prophet uh, presentation is about the role of, of university, but it's quite relevant to to uh, to us as as uh, academic and as scholar. Uh, Prof. Net um, mentioned that uh, university is not helping because university is becoming closer closer to, to the industry, and I think it is it is quite relevant to the context of Indonesia because uh, the bureaucratization of uh, universities in Indonesia. Uh, want to get more uh, workers than than uh, than than people who are compassionate uh, aware of uh, their social responsibility for example and uh, just one example is that several uh, months ago uh, there are there are one student in my university it, it is uh, uh, so unfortunate that uh, who, who killed suicide from from net so it is so uh, you know heart, heartbreaking uh, for us as a, as a lecturer as a university, but the, 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 my, my my question is whether this also uh, whether the university is a part of this of this tragedy uh, tragedy event, uh, and also something interesting in your in Prof.net presentation is that uh, when Prof.net says that we all we always are talking about peace peace, but we are uh, neglecting those who are making profit of the peace. I think it is it is a quite interesting uh, statement and how we 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 uh, deal with this. This is going to be a, a very interesting topic of discussion. Well, I think uh, it's now a question and answer. I would like to invite uh, everyone in this room to to raise uh, his or her hands to uh, directly uh, uh, share. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, just one thing that this Q and A, let it be a collective one. Of course, I can answer certain things, but if there are some with me, you could also uh, help answering the questions or raising other questions. Uh, okay. So thank you. So you you prefer we collect uh, the question first and then we'll go to you for for, for response. Uh, no, no. I think you can have a discussion, more of a conversation uh, than. I think that would be better if you have a conversation, but people need to keep it brief and not. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well, not prof. Okay. Is there anyone? Uh, I will. I will open. I will open for for participant or three to to start uh, the the discussion. Pak Roy Yosep is uh, is raising his hand. Who? Pak Roy Yosep. Oh, Roy Yosep. Okay. Yeah. Please, please, Roy, Don't forget to mention uh, where you're from. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can Can you hear me? Okay. Clearly. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nataraja. I'm uh, very happy to hear. I'm actually from Kerala. Uh, at present, I am doing PhD uh, at uh, ICRS in Indonesia in Yogyakarta. So very happy to listen to you, sir. Uh, uh, you said the uh, world is uh, a fragmented, broken world, and uh, universities are uh, producing knowledge based on fragmented uh, knowledge system. And uh, 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 there is a difficulty, real difficulty to solve this problem because we are in such a situation. But at the end of the talk, you mentioned that there is a moral and spiritual crisis. Uh, uh, is my humble uh, um, uh, observation. Uh, is it possible to make gap between uh, this uh, uh, brokenness between uh, different fragments through moral and spiritual enlightenment or 
moral and spiritual enlightenment will help us to solve this problem in a better way this is what i am uh, uh, i would like to uh, hear from you sir thank you so much sorry i uh yeah you know, this is a very uh, very big question <laughs> to take a lot of time to answer but just to just quickly to answer uh, the moral spiritual crisis uh and the act of compassion uh is very cl closely connected in this uh, in many ways but here i would like to address if for instance we can uh, i'm talking globally and yeah, not Uh, locally, and that will take another level of discussion. But globally, if you look at this issue that I have, I had uh, uh, referred to, many people talk about it, uh, the issue of peace and those selling weapons. If you can, that is a reflection of a deep crisis in the way in which you are projecting yourself and the way you are acting in the world. You are selling weapons. To, to get nowadays weapons are sold to make money because the war has become a market to sell weapons it's no more it's no more just fight between people people wars are also created so you have created war as market and you are selling weapons and on the other side you go to international fora and talk about peace the same persons are in different places or the same countries are there so i think that has to be addressed at a global level and i said moral spiritual crisis one second there are about maybe you know globally about 2000 2005 but internationally maybe about 10 absolutely rich people crazily rich people they don't need that much of it if you have that kind of money why are we having people who are dying of hunger in the in the in the world do you, do you the, the nature of our crisis is that you have on one side people who have such immense amount of wealth and you have on the other side young people young people not not even the i mean i'm not even talking the old young below 15 years people are dying of hunger death and other kinds of related issues including wars where young people are also dying so you have one side enough wealth in the world we have produced enough wealth there is enough wealth in the world but on the other side we have people who are dying of hunger how do you actually ma ma uh, understand this uh, you know by creating more wealth i don't think so the problem is here how do we actually redistribute this wealth how do we get people to think that creating wealth is not about a, 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 you know a holding wealth about if you do not have that kind of uh, a moral or spiritual orientation then you you have a situation of this kind where you have enough wealth in the world you have people dying off and you have you have you look i shared you with a figure of how many women female labor is how much of care they are giving and what is what are we doing to them what is the return in terms of just supporting them so if you look at this kind of global figures then i i i i think that this cannot be understood by any technology this can be only understood by the moral spiritual orientations of the way the world is been uh, has been made or uh, how we do our day to day living how 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 we our lifestyle it so it is this is not going to be resolved the, the problem the issue is we have enough wealth in the world we have enough production in the world the issue is about redistribution the issue is about sharing the issue is about reaching out for people who need don't talk to me about foundations and csr and all those things that are all being done and you know where that where that are poised there are some genuine foundations but many of these foundations have got another darker side of their on of their own living so i will leave leave it there so uh, to the good extent we can take care of the global problems if we address this moral spiritual crisis Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Prof. Okay, I, I would like to invite all the participants to just jump into the uh, conversation, conversation rather than we are yeah, doing yeah. like question and answers. Yes, Please thank you. Share your your ideas, your comment. Uh, if you want to uh, raise 
uh, in other issues related, related to the topic, please, please uh, raise your hand and uh, I will allow you, allow you to speak. And by the way, Prof. Ned, there is one comment in the chat room uh, from uh, CRCS UTM. Okay. Uh, I would like to read the comment for you, Prof. Ned. Maybe you can uh, respond it. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, 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 Prof. Ned, thank you for your fascinating talk. What is the public compassion that you mentioned? Is it different from compassion in religious sense, like we always find in Christianity and, and Buddhism? Or oh, this from your YouTube, uh, Prof. Ned? Uh, can you come again? I, 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 I couldn't hear you well. Uh, what is the public compassion that you mentioned? Is it different from compassion in religious sense, like we always find in Christianity and Buddhism, etc.? So it is a, a question from uh, one participant in YouTube. Would you like to, to respond to this? Uh, okay, I, I will. Uh, can I can I hear a few more questions and come back to this uh, okay. public compassion idea? Thank okay. You. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Yeah. Must answer raise right. hands. Can uh, can I come in now, uh, Mr. Okay. Chair? Please. Mr. Chair, yeah. Okay, please. please, please. Yeah, yeah but, you know I I uh, I fully concur with uh, uh, Dr. Net uh, presentation uh, on the brokenness of the world. Uh, they have. Uh, scattered organization trying to do their bit. You know? <laughs> like in Malaysia, we have uh, a few NGOs and uh, human rights uh, organization uh, trying, to, uh, trying to help it out. So like for instance, during the recent um, uh, flood that we faced in, some parts of um, Malaysia, you know, the, the help really come from the people. This small organization, you know, individual philanthropist. Uh, the government do help, but it takes some time because of the bureaucracy, uh, you know, because of, um, you know, political consideration. They are slow and uh, they, they try to do something, but their actions rather uh, slow in helping out the, uh, um, the distressed people. Now, my point is that uh, Dr. Ned, you know, um, we have no quarrel with, uh, with what you know you uh, you know you have shared with us. You know, we we are equally get the sudden with this brokenness of the world. And you also put some uh, blame to the universities for not being able to take the lead in coming up with a solution to have solved this problem. So my direct question to you, Dr. Net, uh, my apology you know, if it is too hard. What is the suggested uh, solution that you have in mind? You know? Uh, everything seemed to be wrong. Yes, we know we are part of it. You know <laughs> uh, what we want to do. We don't have enough fun, and, and uh, it's been done in a very ad hoc manner. But we cannot rely on UN. You know, so uh, it is more of a lot of discussion, but uh, they are not reaching out. When uh, you know, we we can see it. Uh, you know, I don't want to to delve into it. You know. If you are talking about global response, you know, what should we do? What is your suggestion? What is your modest operandi for us to quickly come up and step up in solving this brokenness before it hell break loose? Thank you. Would you like to respond, Matt? Or we wait for uh, another participant. There is one uh, participant also uh, raised uh, his, his hand from uh, Pak Samsul Marik. Mas Anju. Please, Mas Anju. Thank then, you, Mas Ipung. Yeah, I think. After that, we go to uh, panel. Please, 
Yeah, thank you Masifong. Thank you Masifong. Thank you very much Pak Nat, uh, Prof Nadaraja. Uh, I think my question or my concern is related to the previous questions. Um, but let me formulate my question this way. Since when we realize the world is broken, uh, if, we see, if we understand that today is broken, like the character or indicators that we have, since when we, we have that? Can we do the genealogy of that? And this is also in relation to the previous one about spirituality. Don't we have spirituality things from the beginning, like very long time ago? Uh, can we also ask the question about the spirituality, like moral foundation that being established from very long time ago? Do they succeed or where do they fail? Like how do those people organizing themselves for promoting spirituality? Uh, do they fail in promoting? Do they fail in sharing their ideas? Um, it, it like so, if we try to be objective, like seeing, like this world is full of competitions. Um, like who are the most? Who are the most? I mean, you mentioned your university, but don't we have the same situation even before we have the university so again my basic question is that since when we understand we realize that the world is broken i it just remind me about you know um some religious narrative that says that this broke essentially i mean this world is essentially broken and so this is not the you know the place to live for you know, for eternal life, because it is essentially broken. So if you could relate to that too, uh, that would be great. Thank you very much, Prof. Nadaraja. Thank you, Kwanchu. Uh, I think we should stop uh, the, the, the question. Uh, I would like to, so, to uh, welcome Fana uh, to, to respond to some uh, question related to, uh, to uh, spirituality, your, your suggestion uh, to yeah. this uh, broken uh, word and also wait. I don't yeah. know if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I will respond. It's a three questions. Please, 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 please drop. Yeah, it's uh, three questions and uh, they are quite big questions <laughs> to address. Uh, so I, I, can, I, I do not know if I can do justice to answering them. Uh, about the first one, public compassion, uh, you know, this. Uh, uh, the reason why, why I used public compassion or prophetic anger, uh, uh, you know, just to quickly say that anger uh, is always uh, discouraged, but uh, there is a certain notion that comes out that's just anger. Uh, so when you're talking about just anger and anger for where you feel that social justice was not done and therefore you need to address it, uh, that kind of emotional orientation has been, uh, you know, uh, discussed about as uh, or presented as prophetic anger. So we are talking of an anger that is righteous. So I, I, I just leave it there that this is a kind of notion that I am talking about in terms of experiencing the world in terms of righteous anger, but not getting into a necessarily violent response, but an anger that finds many other ways of expressing itself because it's addressing the issues of a cruel uh, uh, world, a world that does not address the dignity of people and things like that, not necessarily the human rights issue. Okay, so in that context, this public compassion was presented again very simply as against when people talk about self-compassion. You see, this notion of compassion has taken many forms in academic literature. The last time I, when I did some research to just point down the word, I have found 30 different usage of public, uh, 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 the word compassion. But here, I just want to separate it from this self-compassion and public compassion, meaning that there is a notion of self-compassion. Uh, which is access, which is discussed in a number of uh, contexts, psychological as well as uh, religious. I don't want to go to, to the spirituality business. So when when I say public compassion, I'm talking about in the public sphere, in social sphere, 
reaching out to the others, in reaching out others not necessarily in relation to other communities, but also reaching out to the others in relation to non-social, non-human communities. So I use public compassion only in that sense, in the, in the sense of reaching out to a larger, and this is how it is used in, uh, in uh, the uh, activists, the uh, uh, people who are in civil society to reach out to a larger community of beings. You know, when you say public compassion and not about self-compassion or uh, what may be differentiated between empathy and compassion is only uh, compassion for your community or for anyone related to you. You know, it is no more like that which is a slight uh, a misunderstanding of the notion of compassion. Again, this will take a lot of time for discussion or conceptual clarification. There's a distinction between empathy and compassion. So the point I'm trying to make is that there is a difference between self-compassion and public compassion, a public compassion that reaches out to a wider audience, people who have nothing to do with you, communities, nothing, nothing to do with you, and non-human communities too. There's nothing to do with humanity, but you're reaching out to that. So this public compassion in that sense, a larger notion that comes out from a spiritual sense <clears throat> when you look at interconnectedness and interdependence. So that is in relation to answering the question, public compassion uh, as distinguished from uh, other ways of understanding compassion, empathy or, you know, uh, and things like that. And it is not necessarily religious, Compassion is absolutely political. When you say something like, you know, uh, uh, as a discussion once ago, when, when you say something like Allah is the most merciful, most compassionate, most sacred, that cannot be just a spiritual language. This is also a political language because to experience that most compassionate nature, most merciful nature you have to be you if you want to stand by that you know in defending people in protecting people in nurturing life that will have to take more than just a spiritual position it has to unfold in the arena of politics i'm not talking party politics in the arena of politics it will become public you cannot be express this sacred this way in which you talk about allah without talking about the politics of it so I am just leave it there that, you know, the public uh, aspects of it. And I go to the next question about uh, suggested solution. I'm so, I'm so, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, uh, disappointed because the people who are so, so well versed, they have no clue of what is happening on the ground in different, different countries without talking about UN, without talking about it, there are many, many movements in the country which they can actually refer to, address, be participate, be part, uh, participate. But instead of that, they have to think about only the government, the most popular movements, uh, the UN, but they won't, don't want to talk about a simple thing, United Religious Initiative. That's a powerful, uh, you know, alternative movement. You, you take about all the uh, uh, different agroecological movements in different parts of the world. Look at the indigenous movements in the different parts. You will not then ask this question because they are looking at many things that you have no clue that uh, uh, they are going beyond the, the kind of questions I'm asking is also raised by them. Look at the world uh, indigenous movements. Look at the questions they are asking. Look at the, go for the conferences, go for their, I mean, I listen to them. And they will refer to a, a very different kind of kind of discourses. And there's nothing to you. You if you stop listening to all these other discourses and only listen to them, then you may be able to understand that there are many other discourses, many other narratives in the world that are going on which we are not listening to, because the whole media is presenting to you a kind of narrative that you want to listen to or which is being projected by mainstream media, even our national mainstream media are projecting that. We do not listen to the narratives of the other uh, smaller voices. Even the Ukraine, Ukraine has got so many narratives which we are not listening to. We are listening to all the big narratives. 
Now there are a lot of things flowing, uh, you know, going through this WhatsApp and they send that of all kinds of alternative narratives. And you need to listen to them. They, if you don't listen to them, then you come and ask questions that there are solutions. We need solutions. We need so this is the language of the university uh, mainstream leaders and managers. We want solutions. Solutions are already there. I don't think the problem is with the solutions. The problem is with the political uh, uh, support for some of the solutions which are already available with the indigenous movements, with the many other alternative movements in the world. Only thing we have to listen to them, we have to go and look at what are these alternative movements in the world that are talking about number of things which can support a, a, a world, which can actually pace this brokenness of the world with compassion. We need to do that. And not look at only our governments or look at these big, big things that comes to us through the main media. So I would suggest, while I'm not answering your question uh, directly, I would like to ask you to ask the questions, stop thinking about solutions as though you are going to invent a solution, the university is going to invent the solutions, or UN, UN is going to invent the solutions, or some big, go and look for people who are already talking about great solutions. Go and look at YouTube. You look at some of the great teachers there. Uh, some very, very good uh, discussions on teachers. Go and look at, uh, 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 explore uh, other movements that are going on in the world. Just Google them and they, Google them or do the deep uh, uh, web search. Look for these organizations which are hardly referred to by global media and stop looking at global media as a standard of uh, understanding the narratives of the world. The narratives of the world are much, much more richer. And we do not have access to that because we keep listening to the same narratives from the global media. You can please look at other things, other kinds of centers of where narratives are being discussed. Progressive, uh, humanistic, uh, spiritual nature, what great things are being discussed. And that may have the solutions that we are looking for. We don't have to go look for. Uh, create solutions in a boardroom and say, oh, here's a solution. And here we are the solutioners for the global brokenness. <laughs> so I, I think the, the whole idea of the Pitsugi is already a solution. It's a solution that brokenness can be put together, but we need to decide what is the goal we are going to use. Technology, political parties. Is that the uh, solution we're going to put? Uh, a religion, not spirituality, yeah. put religion there and then talk about solution. No, we don't need that. Uh, we don't always need that. We need to look at, keep the windows open, but we look at the, the windows which are still closed, forcibly closed and not allowed to be opened or not. We can't see through those windows because nobody wants to discuss that. You go, for today, took the Ukraine problem narratives. You take the narratives, then you see all overlapping narratives, including the bio labs in Ukraine. Some other narrative is coming in or some other problems are coming in. So you will begin to see a very different world right from the WikiLeaks uh, at the Snowden period. We are privy to only information the global media wants to tell us. But if you look at Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia, uh, not Wiki, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Julian Assange, look at uh, Edward Snowden and look at the world that they are showing you of what, how we are being manipulated, how, what kind of framework we are getting into, then we will see a very different, very, very different world. Okay, I, 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 I would think that you need to explore this world before thinking that we need to sit in a boardroom and create solutions. The solutions are already there. That is my uh, humble, very humble, uh, 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 sharing uh, with this little bit prophetic anger that, you know, the alternatives are not given space. You are still talking from a mainstream university or international organization framework. That's not going to help us. Okay, that is a, just uh, related related to that. I, I, I uh, 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 the third, what's your name, sir? Samsu. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Okay, okay, Anju. Uh, about this uh, issue that moral spiritual crisis, when I say this, I'm actually referring back to these 500, 600 years of a new economic system that emerged. This, this emergence of the new economic systems and the morality it was based on created a situation that has largely focused our attention on growth 
and materialism and growth. It's pushed it in that way, including our life world. You know, it's moving in one direction. And I am not looking, uh, you know, I understand when you say that brokenness is how religions have, religions have uh, referred to the world. They have always said that we, are, that we live in a broken world. And so our religious duty is to get out of this religious world by doing certain things and reaching whichever uh, 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 you know, uh, transcendental reality that we are supposed to reach. Different people have different ways. I mean, different faith have different ways of projecting that. I understand that. I understand that what you are, and it's a very good observation saying that religion also have talked about brokenness of the world, brokenness of the uh, soul, and we need to mend that by living in this world in a particular way. I am not actually referring, there is a whole political economy in the, pro, in the process I am talking about. This political economy, is, this political economy starts around five, six hundred years ago with the development of capitalist mode of production and a particular way in which our societies have been organized both in terms of politics, culture. So this particular movement of society has created a kind of situation in which somebody can make money in the middle of a pandemic and we have, while allowing a lot of people to die. We can talk about P, or we can talk about poverty, but not talk about affluence because affluence seems to be the system a uh, means of success. So I'm only referring to that moral crisis in the, in the process of, you know, looking at profit and profit and nothing but profit any which way you can, including, including starting wars as market to sell weapons, which also involves a lot of killing of people in the context of market and killing of creativity in the context of production of the weapons. So it, this, this, a uh, large world which we have created out of particular way of organizing our economy has created a kind of morality, a kind of crisis that I would say spiritual crisis because this kind of system requires a certain way of organizing the academics. It has organized it that way to its advantage. And that kind of uh, organizing the, of the academics of our knowledge production has actually disrupted the old, old, the ancient way of looking at spiritual knowledge, which is an integrated way of looking at knowledge, the cosmological way of looking at knowledge. That has been interrupted by this long drawn political economy of our development. So I am only referring to that. I say, if you want to break this, and regain our spiritual sense of a totality of being connected. I am connected to you. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. I am connected to you. The fact that I am a living being, you are a living being, you are as sacred as anybody else in this screen. If I cannot see that, and I see that you, as, you, uh, as you and me, and you are something different, then I have not even crossed the, the basic boundary of our living together. You know, that I don't see your sacred life as an important sacred life, as my own sacred life. That kind of reality at the back, in spirituality, I'm not talking about religious sense, which is, it just got a lot of other kind of complications in terms of institutions and power. In a sp mystical, sp mystic spiritual sense, then uh, 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 if, we, if, we, uh, if we see it that way, then this idea of what you just said, that even spirituality, that is not, the, that is not true. Religion, yes. Spirituality has the much longer, religion came later. Spirituality has a much longer history with us. And if you go back to some of the ancient, the indigenous people's ways of life, you will actually connect with spirituality much more than you sp uh, connect with religion. <laughs> so, yes, religion did talk about uh, brokenness, but I'm talking about the last five, 600 years in relation to a political economy that has completely marginalized our spiritual sense and with, with it our compassionate sense. And we live in a world which is absolutely a one which we directly and indirectly promote in terms of its cruelty. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wanak. Uh, when, you, when, when you say that compassion is political and uh, alternative undertaking space uh, to be honest it, it uh, you know it bring me to a certain kind of uh, pessimism uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in seeing uh, the fate of this uh, this report.
Oke, okay, we still have a uh, five minute left in case there is uh, someone else to to raise uh, issues, comment. Uh, <laughs> this is this has been a really draining uh, session. Uh, you know, a lot of involvement. Thank you so much. Uh, but I think uh, you know I will. Uh, I, I, I almost drained my energy sharing some of these thoughts and some very powerful questions. Uh, I would just like to listen to the questions, but uh, you know, maybe answer it some other time <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> if someone can actually share their thoughts. In fact, you know, and, and start asking me questions. You can share your thought, critical, supportive, whatever. I mean, what, your own observation that will be helpful also for me in terms of my own growing this develop uh, this way of thinking and feeling and sharing. Yeah, uh, thank thank you, uh, Anat. But I mean, you you brought some things uh, very interesting related to to uh, this <coughs> issue, and uh, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, as for myself, I'm uh, I'm eager to know more about what what comp compassion uh, is political means. Uh, and so, okay, uh, thank you I, for that. <laughs> I, I'll I'll keep that in mind. It's very <laughs> political. It's so political that you know. There are about in uh, two years ago, there were 300 environmental ecologists who were murdered. Ah. You, you, if you go and look at the figures of the ecologists and the people who worked for indigenous communities and their societies, they were assassinated. That cannot have happened if compassion was not political. Thank you. Okay. Okay, anyone? We have uh, three minutes left. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I still believe that without political will, nothing will change, you know, because uh, if we do it a bit and piece. But I do agree with, uh, with Dr. Nat, uh, everybody has got to play their role. The solution is there from, uh, you know, people at the ground who are uh, experiencing it. You know, they, we normally want to tell them how to solve their problem. You know, today I'm learning. Go to them, listen to them. Then you will be able to get, uh, you know, the more uh, realistic solution. Then you are the ivory tower doing all the research and come up with, uh, uh, you know, with a lot of suggestion, a lot of uh, uh, solution. But all that useless cannot be worked out, you know. Go to the university. We have stack and stacks of thesis been done. What happened? You know, nothing that could be done simply because uh, there is no concerted execution to make sure such problem that can be addressed. You know, so uh, uh, Doctor Ned, just one or two minutes. If you can talk about, uh, you know, Malaysia is doing some move some movement on the Sajatra leadership. How, how do you look at it from the global Sajatra aspect in, in trying to fix, <laughs> in trying to help fix the, uh, uh, the brokenness of this world? Prof. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pazul. I think we now come to the end of the, the session because it's already uh, two thirty. Uh, thank you, uh, Pak Nat. Thank you uh, for the participant. I think we had a very we had a fascinating uh, discussion about about uh, this issue. And uh, even though the world is broken, but I hope that our heart are still united. And uh, we'll see you again in the next session of Wednesday Forum. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pak Nat. See you. Thank you very much, Pak Nat.